Welcome to the Cool Tools Show. I'm Mark Frauenfelder, Editor-in-Chief of Cool Tools, a website of tool recommendations written by our readers. You can find us at cool-tools.org. I'm joined by my co-host, Kevin Kelly, founder of Cool Tools. Hey, Kevin. Hey, it's great to be here. In each episode of the Cool Tools Show, Kevin and I talk to a guest about some of his or her favorite uncommon and uncommonly good tools they think others should know about. Before we introduce this week's guest, I want to give a shout out to our Patreon supporters. Patreon is a great way to support everything Cool Tools does, including our newsletters, podcast, video channel, and our review website. This week, we want to give a shout out to Sarah T. Willis, Jamie Ehrman, and Brian Brooks. To become a patron of Cool Tools, visit patreon.com slash cool tools. Our guest this week is Donald Bell. Donald is the creator and host of the weekly video series, Maker Update. He's a writer for Autodesk, and you've probably seen him on the Cool Tools YouTube channel, where he's been creating tool review videos for us since 2017. Wow, that's like almost what, four years. How's it going, Donald? It's, it's going great, yes. Yeah, I've yeah. been having a lot of those, four I think, especially years. after this past year. A lot of those skipped year, like, wow, it really has been a long time. Yeah, yeah. yeah Donald, Definitely. so great to have you join us uh, in a different format this time, rather than on video. And um, it does seem like... Or it doesn't seem like it's been that long, but no. um, that is the virtue of doing something on a regular basis. So thank you. Yeah, Yo, you're welcome. I love doing it. Cool. Donald, you have tons of great tools because you are a maker of many different kinds of things. You're a what we call a broad spectrum enthusiast. <laughs> and uh, your picks this uh, episode reflect that. So why don't we just get started and, and tell us about the first tool on your list? Sure. The, the first one here is the idea and of locking guitar tuners. I've been a guitar player since I was in high school, maybe 14, 15 years old. Um, and um, the, the process of, and, well, first of all, let me say, like, I, I, my, I was thinking about this when I was thinking about how guitars were actually one of my first entryways into kind of fit, having something to fiddle with that was mechanical. I had like my mm. skateboard. And I had my, my bass guitar. Uh, and I feel like in, at that time in my life, those were kind of the first things I had where I could kind of tighten down nuts and bolts and take things apart and put them back together. So um, and one of the kind of rituals of owning a guitar is restringing it, putting the strings on it, which uh, is kind of a pain in the butt. But uh, there is something about it that's once you get used to it is something kind of there's the ritual that's kind of soothing of it. But uh, when you're running the string into a guitar tuner, a traditional guitar tuner, you usually have to give it a lot of slack and you have to do a few winds on the tuning peg before there's enough on the peg to kind of keep the, the string in tension and so it doesn't slip out and un, unwind on you uh, in the process. And it's mm -hmm. there's, there's kind of a an art to it. There's a lot of people with different opinions on exactly how to do it. Uh, having the wind go in one direction or the other, or have it lock on itself. And there's a whole, you know, um, discussion group, I'm sure on best practices for winding guitar string. But one of the things that's come out relatively recently that I've, I've missed the boat on until just like a few weeks ago, <laughs> when I upgraded my one of my guitars tuners, um, are these ideas that this, this, these locking tuners, which basically it, it sounds more involved than it is. I don't go in for a lot of, uh, of extra bells and whistles on my guitar. I like to keep things pretty simple. Um, mm -hmm. And what these do is that it has a, um, a little screw that comes through the back of the tuner that clamps down on the string uh, to keep it in place uh, so that it doesn't come out the little guide hole that you usually have in a tuning peg. And okay. so what it really does is it allows you to quickly run a string into the tuning peg, clamp it down with this extra little, um, this extra little bolt, uh, and then just get to, to tuning your guitar string without all the extra whines and frustration that can come out of traditionally tuning a guitar uh, string. So you don't have to do uh, three different winds. You don't have to keep slack on the string. You can really just run the string right through the guitar um, uh, tuner 
and clamp it down and get to winding it and you you you, you can replace your strings faster and uh, it seems to do a great job of holding tune. So I guess my first initial response is, um, you mean they haven't always done this? I mean, I, it was like the fact that you might have a tightening bolt on the tuner seems to me so obvious. It's like, why does it take so long now? Is there something ingenious about the way it's done? Because that would always be my first impulse if I was inventing a guitar. Yeah. Would be, um, well, this string, you, you, I see he, how you would want to tighten it to, to tune it, but once tuned, you would just lock it down, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's been a lot of different tuner technology. And like I said, I feel like these have been around for a while. Uh, there's been a lot of different tuning, tuning technology that can get very complicated quickly. There's even like robotic tuning heads that you can get that will always be listening to your uh, your 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 guitar string to make sure to keep it in tune. Those can get extraordinarily expensive. These are no more expensive than a traditional guitar t- um, uh, tuning um, peg. But, uh, and I don't know if that's always been the case. Maybe the new thing is that they're much more affordable now. I've just, I've never purchased a guitar that has these types of locking tuners on them before. So it was a revelation for me to get them. And even though there's things like this where I'm sure there's a lot of eye rolling from the guitar community that might be say like, we've known about this and we've done this for years. As someone who's been playing the instrument for a long time, and maybe I don't frequent guitar shops as often as I should, um, it was a new to me kind of experience where I'm like, wow, I want to put these kinds of tuners on all of my guitars. Does it help in keeping the guitar in tune? Uh, well, the, the reason I went about getting these tuners was because I was having, at least on one particular string, uh, uh, an issue with the intonation and the detuning of the string that is, um, it's hard to say exactly what the, the problem is with it. I've, I've, whenever I've brought up to, to people that I think my tuners are a little bit loose and ten, tend to um, loosen up over time, a lot of people, the majority of people say there's no chance that that's the problem. Like it's probably uh, the, the nut on your, your fretboard or some other issue. It's rarely the tuner. In this case, um, whether it's the new set of strings I put on there along with these tuners or the tuner itself, it has helped my problem. Uh, but I don't think that they advertise themselves as being particularly better at holding tune. I think the real trick is that they make it much easier to string up your guitar. And you say that they're about the same price. So it looks like they're about, I don't know, $33 for a set of six? Yeah. The, the, the brand I went with, mostly because they had the configuration of uh, the, the headstock I have, which is kind of like three tuning pegs kind of set in one direction and three set in a different direction. Um, if it's more of a straight line, strat style uh, tuning system, you can you can get them. I've seen them more affordable. I've seen them about half this price from different companies, but the, the brand I went with was about $30 for a set. Mm-hmm. Cool. That and, looks and they're cool. Not electronic. They're just, they're just a little, they're very basic uh, they, mechanical. Yeah. Uh, they, they, I mean, you can, they come in all different styles. The style I was looking after was a kind of a, a, a real direct replacement for what's called the vintage style. Uh, tuners that I, I had on my guitar. So they look almost indistinguishable from the tuners I already had on there, but they just have this one extra uh, tension bolt in the back that allows it to clamp down on the string so that you can just get to winding it up and tuning it up. And do you use one of those little cranks? That <laughs> I do use one. Of, I, I seem to lose it half the time. <laughs> I need to f- replace my guitar strings. But if I have it handy, I do use a, a plastic little yeah. crank to that's a totally worthwhile expense i think purchase yeah, yeah. And, and a good p- a pair of uh of little cable clips and by the way uh, for those who know cable clips will cut cable without smushing it i mean <laughs> that's, that's a technical term so they're they're very handy well so don tell us about um your second pick all right. The, the second pick uh, is another maybe controversial pick here. Uh, everyone kind of, I think anyone who has a workspace or a workshop struggles with how to keep it organized. Uh, I know that there's a million different solutions for uh, uh, all the different ways that people 
want to have their workshop organized. I just I struggled with figuring out what, would the, what was the best solution for me. A lot of times that comes down to what is the size of the thing you're trying to store? How frequently do you want to access it? Where do you have space in your workshop? Uh, and for me, like I have a lot of friends who have storage bins or they've, they've con- constructed little shelving units that perfectly fit the exact style of storage bin that they've, they've gotten. Um, I didn't have a, a space to even, I have a pretty small workshop. So what I went with ultimately were these acro mills bins that are stackable bins. And the acro mills system, if you've ever looked at it, it comes in a, a hundred different sizes and flavors. Um, but I, the, the, the pain with the little bin system, and you can also get the cheap ones for Harbor Freight too. Um, the pain with the bin system is trying to find a way to hook them onto something or to, to stack them up or have a shelf for them. So what they have are these uh, steel wall panels that come in a, a variety of sizes too that allow you to have uh, a very strong steel lip, almost like a French cleat system for you to hang the Acro Mills plastic bins from. Uh, and so I, I, I put one in my, my small workshop and then I wound up putting another one later on in my garage, and uh, they've they've been a real benefit. You can um, you can set them up pretty high on a wall uh, in kind of dead space that you wouldn't otherwise be using, and they are there's really no space required. And like a shelving unit, they don't cut, they come out from the wall at all. Like it's you know a millimeter of of, uh, you know, steel that you you're screwing into your wall to kind of cleat in these different bins. So they're very space efficient and, uh, they've really helped me out. So I have the Harbor freight version, which I have, I don't know, maybe a couple hundred of them that covered my workshop. And what's on um, both of these systems is that you can get different sizes. So, right. um, there's a modular version where you can, um, either have one that's big or small and um uh, on the same metal uh framing back backdrop uh so they and, and the other advantage is that you can move things around very easily so you can swap out the locations uh, which is what i do over time you know as things cluster around a certain theme i can just quickly move things very, absolutely very i i found that just yesterday i i felt like I, one of my bins keeps like my spare batteries uh, and I realized, oh, I kind of need that lower so that my son can come in and get a battery and not ask me to kind of get up and reach it for him. So I can I can move around the, the order of the bins and, and see what works for me right. best. Um, yeah. And so for me, particularly the Harbor Freight version of this was also the most economical of all the alternatives that I looked at in terms of even versus buying pine boarding for shelving. This was mm-hmm. turned out to be um the quickest and the most cost efficient. And oh, by the way, they look great too. Yeah, it looks really pro. Um, and yeah, the Harbor Freight system, I haven't, I, I haven't seen it in particular. I've seen their, their, at least the bins. I imagine it's the same kind of setup. I yeah. do like that. I don't know if Harbor Freight has this too, that the particular bins I got for most of them, there are some smaller ones, but my main bins are a clear plastic, mm. which can be helpful. Um, yeah. Sometimes just for eyeballing what's in the the bin. Right, right. Yeah, I, uh, the, I think Harbor Freight does not have a clear one, so I'm I'm uh, I went with the bright red. Um, so yeah, but but as as a system, I think it's it's a really very good um, way. There's a, there's a front lip that you could put labels on or write in with a sharpie. Um, the contents and so i find it a fantastic um way to go for organizing things and, yeah uh, and also i found like unlike um like a a, a a tupperware bin kind of system when you take them down and put the, those bins on your workbench uh being able to stack them but still be reach be able to reach into them can be really helpful too right uh, so you're not having to manage different lids and and put things all over the place you can kind of take the bins you want off the wall stack them up on a corner of your table and still be able to access all the parts without having to juggle all the bins. Right. And um, so I, I, I have, for myself, I have mostly larger things. I have larger bins with larger things in them. They're very tiny, 
you know, screws and bolts I have in the kind of I, the Harbor Freight now that used to be Stanley tray sort, sorting bins, I guess they call them. But there's also a version of these where they're smaller, um, smaller size ones that are perfect for screws that, you know, kind of like a, maybe fist, a fistful yeah. level uh, box. Or I, I, actually, or I, <laughs> I got a bunch of those by mistake. I thought they were the larger <laughs> bins. They seemed too affordable for me to not order. And I, I, I have those and they've actually wound up being pretty handy for smaller things like you're saying. Um, the other thing I'll say, like when I was going about trying to solve the problem of like what type of bin system do I need or what kind of solution do I need? I was just looking at how I was storing things currently and for the most part, for a lot of a lot of what I do is, is smaller electronics projects. I was using old Adafruit boxes, um, and I still have a bunch of um, uh, cardboard, uh, s- a small kind of shoebox style um, boxes for the Adafruit components that I've ordered in. And I was just kind of labeling those and stacking those. And so for that size of thing, uh, these are a good substitution that's a lot more manageable. Yeah. Well, great pick. And what do you use to label them? I'm I'm putting on, uh, usually I'll just uh, write a label on some washi tape or something like that and mm-hmm. just slap it on. I, I haven't gotten okay. too sophisticated with my labels. Yeah. Also, That's because good. like like Kevin was saying, the, the modularity of it, I didn't really want to make up anything too permanent. I wanted something I could easily tape over or, or redo if I realized that, oh, I don't want to store my batteries here. I want something else in here instead. The ones I have have a fairly thick lip, about almost an inch high, and I just use a, a Sharpie on them. And then if I want to change it, I just um, take out some solvent and erase it. Um, and so I find um, that that works. Yeah, I have some bright yellow kind of washi tape that I, I use that has helped for both kind of clarity and uh, visibility. So these are called the... Afro Mills. And are they the originator? I mean, the kind of the original uh, version that Harbor Freight is imitating or? Acro Mills with a, with a K, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think these are the original system. Uh, and they're, they're pricier to get, much pricier than the Harbor Freight from what I've seen. Uh, but you can sometimes get them inexpensively whenever there's like a, a company that has any kind of... Uh, engineering department or R&D department and they're liquidating stuff. You can find these up on, um, uh, you know, Craigslist pretty frequently. And do you know if they're interoperable, whether they're the same dimensions, whether you could use the Harbor Freight bins on the Acro Mills uh, plate or vice versa? I don't know for sure. Yeah. I would imagine so. I'll also say when, and during the same time of discovering what the solution would be that would work best for my situation. I, I ordered in a bunch of um, kind of perforated steel pegboard system. I forgot what it was called, um, but it's not worth advertising because it didn't work out well for me anyways. <laughs> but I thought maybe uh, I'd never had a, like a pegboard system before, and they always look cool when I see them uh, on YouTube or other people who have pegboards in their studio. But it just was not a good solution for me. It just it didn't seem like a very efficient use of the space. Right. Um, there's one little use if you have a smaller kind of metal pegboard. And in fact, I have a video I haven't posted yet. Um, I use it to put on, to make like a bit, basically a recharging station of wiring on, you know, with uh, tape and ties, all the chargers that I'm using for all kinds of batteries. Sure. All in one spot. And having access to the back was necessary to kind of um, put together and stuff. So I found a metal pegboard um, used for that as, as a place to tie and mount all the chargers for all my battery needs. Um, And um, that would be one place you might even consider reusing it now that you have it. Yeah, it's great. And also, I mean, the idea of the pegboard really spoke to me because there is such a huge, community of contributed 3D printable designs for pegboards for adapting yeah. mm-hmm. uh, very specific things or or even like um, mm-hmm. uh, designs that you can you, you can input in like the, the number of you know drill bits you want to 
you want it to hold and it can come up with a, a custom parametric design that will fit a pegboard. Like there's all kinds of cool stuff out there for pegboards. Um, but I just, I couldn't, once I got it, once I got it and thought like, Oh, I'm going to find the coolest thing to 3d print and install on here. I just couldn't find something I really wanted. Um, Donald, what's washi tape? Uh, <laughs> in my mind, it's a kind of uh, a Japanese, um, slightly glossy masking tape uh, that is uh, when I when I was in Tokyo, I think maybe on your recommendation, I went to the the Tokyo hand store, and there were just aisles of this particular kind of easily terrible, inexpensive, um, all kinds of colors of this. It's like a it's like a masking tape kind of tape. Um, but it was, it was everywhere. So I, I brought some rolls of it back and maybe I'm using the term incorrectly. Uh, but it, I, I, my understanding is that it's, it broadly refers to um, a Japanese style of slightly thicker masking tape. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds right to me. And the idea is, is that the, the surface of it is not that kind of Maybe textured is more of a smooth surface masking tape. That at least that's the stuff I got my hands on. Yeah. Okay. Alrighty. Well, it sounds cool. like perfect label tape. <laughs> yeah, good stuff. So, um, you're th- you're on a roll with cool tools. Tell us a third one. All right, uh, third one. Uh, and <laughs> I feel like all of these so far have been like ones that some people are going to think are very obvious. But um, <laughs> when when I was starting out with a, a just a small set of tools before I even had a garage when I just kind of had a uh, I, I knew one of the first tools you're ever going to buy is a is a electric drill or a drill of some kind and my drill was like my everything it was my electric screwdriver it was for drilling holes it was for putting together Ikea furniture it was everything and then when I came up in the world I was able to buy both a uh, an impact driver and my have my electric drill and at that point, my electric drill didn't have to be everything for me. It really just had to be a drill. And so my breakthrough moment was just keeping in that drill at all times this uh, with a countersink drill bit, which is a, a kind of tapered drill bit. They come in different sizes. And I think the one I have linked here is like a four piece set that comes in different sizes. Um, and they're they're kind of perfectly made for drilling the kind of pilot hole you want to drill for a um a drywall screw in particular um but so they you they have a a, a little uh, at the base of the drill bit they have a, a a countersink so that it can drill out a little bit of that that space for the um for the the screw to go into and it's just been instead of me hunting around all the time for the perfect size drill bit to put into my drill, I feel like nine times out of 10, this thing can drill the hole that I want it to drill. And then I can just kind of, if I know I have a project where I need to drill a pile of hole and then screw something into it, I can just come out with both my drill and my impact driver. And instead of swapping bits, I can just hit it with the, the countersink drill, drill bit and then pick up the other tool and just drill something in. And that's been a different way of working than I had ever worked when I really just had the one tool and not a lot of space to store them in. Right. And the, and the countersink bit, it, it reduces a two-step process for most people to one step. So it used to be you'd have to drill it, take out the bit, put it in the counter drill, uh, countersink drill, and then drill that. And what this does is it does it all in one pass. Does so, it all in one pass. And I also, there's something about the, the taper of the bit which means that even if you're off a little bit by how big a hole you're drilling, chances are the screw you're drilling into that hole will bite at least halfway down the hole you made, even if you overdid it a little bit with that with the size of the the drill bit that you're going. There's there's going to be a place where that that drill uh, the screw will bite in. And you're right about um, having that uh, two two having the separating the drilling from the screwing. Um, also really does speed up the process. Um, yeah. And I've seen some kind of fancier flip around bits that will have like a, a screwdriver bit on one side and then you pop it out and flip it over. And then it's like the countersink bit on the other. So, but they're, they're pricey 
And eventually, and I've had uh, some of these already break on me. Eventually, your 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 bit will fail, and you'll you'll want to get a, a new you know countersink drill bit. Um, and having a more expensive flip around style one might be good for someone who's going super minimal and doesn't want to have a lot of tools. But um, this system's worked out well for me. Yeah, and uh, the ones you link to the Irwin ones are they particularly better than others, cheaper than others, or is there a particular reason why? these out of all the chineseums available <laughs> i i don't think it matters too much uh this set's been good for me i think i just i i think the first one i bought was actually uh i i went to my local hardware store and picked up just a single one and what i, I figured was going to be the, the good enough size for me and then when that one broke i'm like these have been really handy i'm going to go buy this four pack and maybe uh i'll have having the different sizes will come in handy and really, I the the biggest of the bits it, I rarely use, but I have it around. Right. And so anyway, for the, for the readers or listeners, there are multiple alternatives, no name brands and others uh, available out there, all very similar. Um, so Donald, uh, your fourth um, tool, tell us about that. Yes, uh, I feel like this is. This is what I made a, a video for that you can find on the Cool Tools YouTube channel. And it's called mm -hmm. the Airmon uh, Air Quality Monitor. And mm -hmm. it's a, a little, maybe tennis ball size. It's, it's, it's a cube, but about the size of a tennis ball. And it's a portable air quality monitor that it's, it's amazing. The design looks really cool. It, it looks like something you'd want to keep on your desk. Like I, I that, the fact that it's so attractive was one of the things that compelled me to buy it. Um, but the, the main reason I got it, it was because it fire season happens here in California all the time. And uh, when it's upon us, knock on wood, uh, you, you wake up every day checking the air quality reports and you're trying to see if there's an orange cloud around you or a red cloud around you or what color the map is around your home. Um, and all of the, typically those are readings that are taken outdoors from different monitors that are around your town. Uh, but, and so to take, you take measures against that. You, you try to seal up your doors, you try to run your air purifiers, all that stuff. But, um, you, without something like this, you don't really have a good sense of whether or not you've done the, a good job of, uh, purifying the air in your home, Right. You need some kind of internal measure to know like, okay, it might be a, a red cloud outside of my door, but how well have I cleaned the air inside my home? Uh, so this gives you an indication of that. It specifically looks for the PM 2.5 particle size that is the most damaging to your lungs. Um, and it comes, you, you pair it with an app, an adorable uh, little uh, Japanese animation app that almost is adorable to the point where you think like, this can't be a serious <laughs> tool, but um, it, it is. And it, it even advertises the, the brand of air particle sensor, which is made by Sharp, um, that this particular monitor uses. And when you uh, open up the app, you, you tell it to run, it runs for you know maybe 10 seconds, kind of moving air, you hear like a little fan, like a little tiny computer fan as it's moving air past the sensor to tell what the air quality is. And then it gives you a reading and the little character on the display will be either like jumping with joy that you've got clean air or he'll be a little bit, you know, sad and have a mask over his face. And but you'll get an actual reading and then those readings will store in your app so that you can look over time. You can kind of see the the greatest hits and, and the the and the worst days that of uh, what your air quality has been like and maybe the the best part about it is that it's it's rechargeable so you can bring it to every little room in your home you can bring it into your car you can bring it with you if you you know if there's ever a situation where you want to be able to tell if the air is healthy to breathe in that environment um, it packs well and can be um you can take a reading from it anywhere. Do, do you have any idea about its like precision or how sensitive it is? Like if you were to uh, have a smoky um, cooking food that might make some smoke, would it would it register on on there? I, I haven't done uh, enough stress testing on it to be able to to tell you, but I do know that I've I, I 
during fire season, I ha- had some good days and bad days that it was able to detect on there. It wasn't, wasn't always jumping for joy, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, I know there's a, a, some friends gave me, um, I think it's called purple air. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is maybe is an outside. Uh, I'm not really sure, but h- how does it compare to maybe some of the other air quality monitors? I, th- I think it's selling point is, uh, first and foremost, that it's less expensive. Um, okay. I, I think this one is closer to $30 to pick up. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Purple Air, I believe, was a considerably more expensive system. Okay. Uh, so I, I think in that regard, it's, it's, a, it's a different price point. If if you didn't think if you kind of wanted to solve for this problem but didn't want to throw that amount of money on it, this is something that you could buy more on a whim for thirty dollars and and see if it gives you enough peace of mind without feeling like you really need the full the full report. Um, but it's uh, this one also you can switch it into an outdoor mode so that you it's maybe I think it it takes in more air maybe when it's in outdoor mode um, to be able to give you a reading and for that, but it's, I'm not really thinking about it's being needing to be, uh, super detailed in its report. I just need, I need some kind of measurement, some kind of thumbs up or thumbs down on whether or not the smoke's getting in. And this for me feels like it, it, it solves that for me. Okay. That's really great. So do you need to clean the sensor out ever? Uh, I haven't. And I, I, I don't even think I've I've opened it up. I don't know if it's inaccessible to open up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's also it's one of those little things where it's so cute you kind of you feel bad even taking a screwdriver to it because it's <laughs> like you, you don't want it to be mad at you. Um, yeah, but no, uh, I I haven't thought about its serviceability. Um, but I do feel like again at this price point, if you felt like uh, you, it got, got gummed up, you'd probably just buy a new one. Or you, sure. I would imagine you, the first step would be just to take the air hose and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little can of air. Yeah. And um, yeah. Uh, so, so Don, tell us um, about some of your recent projects. What, what are you um, up to? Well, I'm still cranking out maker update. Uh, I now trade off weeks with my co-host Tyler Weingarner, mm-hmm. uh, who was mm-hmm. the, uh, the, the video producer for a long time at make magazine and for the make yeah. YouTube channel. Yeah, uh, and so Tyler. Well, Tyler also now does work for the Cool Tools YouTube channel. He does. So, right. uh, you'll see Tyler on both channels. <laughs> uh, it's a fun family. Uh, it is. So we've we've been doing that now for some time, and it, it, t- talking about time that's kind of uh, come up faster than you'd think. It, this uh, year, I think in September will be the five year anniversary of when I started that show. Uh, so I'm 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 thrilled that it's still going, that I still love doing it, and that people still seem to be into it. Uh, and and DigiKey is our our sponsor for that show, so the show pops up on the DigiKey YouTube channel. And uh, what, what and does DigiKey? What is DigiKey? DigiKey is a is an electronics parts supplier. So if you're uh, they're, they're they're a veteran. They've been around like forever. Yes, they've been around for a long time. In fact, they, they're kind of now the uh, if you remember, like the the days where you uh, you'd look up a part by its Radio Shack number, right? Uh, right. DigiKey, the DigiKey part number is kind of like the gold standard of when you're making a, a bill of materials for an electronic design you've come up with. If, you, um, if you're trying to tell people what type of capacitor or or uh, resistor or transistor you're using in your design, uh, oftentimes it's assumed you'd include the DigiKey part number in that bill of materials. Uh, so. Uh, they they've been around a long time. They're very excited about uh, the uh, kind of bringing in new generations of uh, people who are into electronics, and so they I think they see Maker Update as a show for um, bringing in people who are who are really start starting to just tinker around uh, with electronics and projects and are excited and um, kind of moving them you know into uh, the world of electronics. That's really great, really great. But yeah, they've been great to work with. That sounds good. Um, so uh, just one quick question before we go. Um, you use a lot of microcontrollers and things in your work. Are you, uh, is Arduino still your top microcontroller choice? And are you using uh, CircuitPython or the Arduino IDE to do your programming? 
Uh, I I'm doing a little bit of both. Uh, I do feel like I'm I'm these days I'm most excited by the boards that are coming out that support Circuit Python and mm -hmm. and using uh, using the capabilities there. They're they're oftentimes easier to prototype with in the sense that it's you can go a lot faster. You can make your mistakes a lot faster. <laughs> you you mm -hmm. can uh, because you don't have to use the Arduino IDE to to program them. Uh, you can plug in the board on any computer. Uh, it'll open up, and you'll see it as a little thumb drive on your computer. You can open up, open up the code immediately, change a few little words, and close it. It'll save, and then you'll get to see the results of whether you fixed the problem or broke it further. Arduino. Uh, I, I still have a lot of projects that use Arduino, but it's a more involved process. Sometimes the bugs you're you're encountering are just the bugs of trying to connect the board to your computer and have them see each other. And those, yeah. that, that can be frustrating. But the, the history and all of the, the legacy of all the great Ar Arduino projects that are out there uh, is still something that you know, for a lot of my work, I'm just I'm searching for what other people have done uh, to solve this problem, seeing if I can adapt their work. And the, the long tail of all the Arduino projects that are out there is, uh, is, a, is a richer resource at this point to, to draw from than the work that's coming up now around CircuitPython. But I, I do think that within the next year or two, uh, there's going to be some parity there, at least for the useful or fun stuff that people want to do, where if, if you want to work with uh, addressable uh, LEDs or you want to work with all the different sensors that Arduino can work with, that the CircuitPython examples that'll be out there are, are going to be just as rich as the ones that are out there for Arduino. Do, do you have any tips or power user tricks for finding an Arduino project that may already exist? Like either search term hacks or other ways of finding something that um, you're searching for? <laughs> Uh, I, I've, uh, sometimes I, my, my first level of attack is usually just looking at Adafruit, <laughs> which gets back to the number of Adafruit boxes that are uh, around my, my workshop. And it's not because they have everything, but what they do have, the examples are really well done and uh, very well documented. And, um, and also if there's a project there, it means that, uh, I can ask about that project on the Adafruit Discord channel and feel like I, I feel not greedy about <laughs> wanting more answers around it uh, because it's their project and, you know, is there a way to do this with this project or that? And so that can be helpful. Um, but when I'm, when I'm really struggling to find something that someone's come up with, uh, it, the, the end of the line for me is hopping on GitHub and doing searches for what I'm looking for on GitHub, and that's a little bit more needle in a haystack, and the results are, are can be dicey, but uh, those are my attack methods. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, that's helpful. That sounds that sounds like a good way to do it. Okay, Donald. Well, this was great chatting with you and catching up with you. Um, where do people go to find out more about you? Uh, MakerProjectLab.com is my my site that collects. Uh, all of the maker updates and some of my projects that I've done. Uh, my, uh, my uh, recently, I, I last year actually, I came up with my my cocktail dispensing robot. Uh, you can find information on that uh, and some of the other stuff I've done. It's, it's all it's all there. Well, great. Sounds good. We'll have that in the show notes too. And don't forget, people that um, yeah, that that Donald does cool tool reviews. So you want if you want to see some of his other suggestions in a visual format, um, check out our cool tool YouTube channel. Donald, thank you so much for being on the show. You bet. It's great talking to you guys. Hey, everybody, it's your co-host Mark, and I wanted to let you know that we have a lot more going on here in Cool Tools than just this podcast. We have our flagship website where we review a new tool every day. That's at cool-tools.org. We also have four different newsletters. We have this podcast. We have a YouTube channel where we review tools. And if you like what you hear and see and read, the best way to help us out is by going to our Patreon page at patreon.com cooltools. 
and donate at any level you wish. You can even contribute $1 a month, and, and that would mean a lot to us. The money that you give us will go towards paying for our transcribing costs, editing videos, and editing the podcast. It goes towards paying contributors who write the reviews for us. It goes towards our equipment costs, our hosting costs, and it supports our very small company of three people. This week, I wanted to give a shout out to some of our Patreon supporters who have been giving us at least $2 a month. And if you give us $2 a month, we'll give you a shout out online. And this week, I would like to thank Michael Sakochia, Molly Starr, M. Velderman, Opposable Thumbs, Pamela Cooley, Patrick Weyer, Paul Hosey, Randy Fisher, Stuart Burroughs Brand, Synaptic Sam, Therese Schwartz, Tom Hawkins, Tom Markham, What Bear, Javier Pangolin, David Lang, Eric Byers, Sean Hartley, Stephen Powell, Greg Lickscheidt, John Hobson, Adam Bristol, Adam Naher, Anonymous, Bill Kempthorne, Bruce I. Niles, Chris Woodruff, C. Kolos, Daryl Flynn, Egg Fliegoff, Eric Hanschrau, Eric Hoover, Godfrey Saldana, Jay Skiles, John M. Larson, Jude Galligan, Kenneth Gilman, and Lucas Frank. Thank you very much for supporting the show, and we will see you next week. We'll be right back.